Hi guys, um, Isaac here, uh, doing the fourth paper, uh, the data response paper uh, from the summer of 2015, so 9708-21, uh, May, June 2015 paper. As usual with these longer papers, I'll go through the data, uh, kind of highlighting some of the key things you need to consider before then going through the first few questions, uh, the compulsory section in more detail, and then kind of Discussing quite quickly the questions at the end, if you guys have any specific questions on any of the optional essays, or not the optional essays, the essays you can choose from, and you want me to go over in more more detail, please do do get in touch and let me know. Um, in terms, yeah, so let's get started and read through this paper. So here we have um, our data, and simply what we've got is this kind of well, uh, it's a data set and an article on the on the oil market, specifically the United States and its relationship with oil and high demand, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So in 2001, we get an, a report which is warning us that by 2022, the U.S. could be importing two thirds of its oil. So it's kind of getting dependency on foreign oil. And this is because they say because if U.S. oil consumption continues rising, so a nice bit of increased demand and production continues to fall, domestic supply falls, we have to import more oil. Clearly. You're needing more oil, but you're not producing as much inside the US. You've got to get it from somewhere else, and they're going to get it from so you're import. However, as the data says, these forecasts are both wrong. Oil production has soared, so they're actually producing more oil um, in the US, um, and consumption uh, has fallen. So people aren't needing as much oil. So we've got the reverse of what the article is suggesting, and it now looks like the U.S. will only have limited, if any, net oil imports. So the U.S. is becoming more self-sufficient. It's using its own production. It's not having to rely on foreign imports much at all. Uh, why is this? Well, a new technique, uh, fracking, hydraulic fracturing, has allowed access to new sources of oil. So they've managed to produce more even in their country because of this. And the U.S. now produces also significant amounts of biofuel from corn ethanol, which is a substitute for gasoline. So they don't need petrol as much as oil. That's part of demand falling substitutes, uh, availability of substitutes. And in addition, we've got um, what's been happening to demand is just important to supply. So one, the reason that we're we're not having as many issues is because we're producing fat, we're increasing supply through fracking, which is an alternative way of getting the oil. And also we're just creating some more substitutes for the oil that we don't need to survive. And then the demand side is really important as well. We've got falling enthusiasm for cars, so people are driving less. And also the U.S. cars are now fuel efficient. So those people who are driving are using yes, less fuel. As you see, what I've done is has highlighted kind of the key bits of information in the article that might be answer the question later. And that's something you should do. Here, in terms of this, we now have we'll, we'll look at figure one, which is showing us consumption. Sign here. Reduction. Like little dotty line there. And net import. So we can see just the relationship between them on figure one. Uh, we can kind of extrapolate. This is probably about 17 there. Okay. Up to about 20, 22 maybe, 21, and back down to like maybe 18. So just like estimating those figures is going to be quite important. Table one here, we've got the price of oil and what's been happening there. Okay, so question one. So with reference to figure one, that's this figure here. Explain the trend in US, oil, US net imports of oil after 2005. So we've got 2005 here. What's going on with net imports? So net imports are here. And we're going down. So you see a decrease in net imports after 2005. What's going to be important here is because it says with reference to figure one, it's not just about kind of saying, oh, it goes down. We've got to say from where to where. So we say according to figure one, we can see that net imports in 2005 were approximately maybe 13, that is. So 13 million barrels a day. Yet by 2010, this figure had fallen to seven. We've got a downward trend in oil uh, during the period in question. That's all you really need to do to get the three marks. Remember, you always have to cite the data if they say with reference to something. OK, question two, um, with the help of a diagram, explain how the new sources of crude oil from hydraulic fracturing, so fracking, and the falling enthusiasm for car prices amongst younger Americans, for cars amongst younger Americans, here we go, so quoting from the article, might be expected to cause a fall in US uh, petrol prices. So here we go, we've got question four, so we'll expect here we've got a demand factor there and also a supply factor, so we're probably going to be expected to talk about both. You need to do two separate demand and supply diagrams or put both shifts on one. But let's talk about um, supply first. So first, we've got this increased supply of crude oil. Uh, means we're going to shift supply to the right, therefore lowering the price. Um, that's the supply side. And then also the demand side here is we're getting decreased demand, and that's also going to lower the price. So both of these are going to be pushing down 
the price of oil. And you need to show that on diagram. Pretty, pretty simple question there. B2, B part two, suggests and explain one factor that might cause the price of gasoline to rise in fact. So counterintuitively, we've got this kind of things that have caused the price to fall, but yet in this 2009 to 2010, you see them, the, the price of oil increases. So there's various different factors and you can actually put any valid suggestion. You just need to explain one factor and give a good reason why it caused the price. Things might be, I've got some suggestions here, things like a rise in taxes, government put a tax on, on petrol, that's going to push the price up. Things like increasing the price of oil on world markets, so US oil suppliers or petrol suppliers are having to buy oil at a higher price, maybe because of OPEC, which is the cartel that controls a lot of oil supply uh, and other things, then that might have caused this price to like jump up and therefore they're going to increase their prices, the domestic oil um, oil consumers, petrol producers, etc. Increased incomes. So if people's income increases, we can say maybe they'll increase the price because people are less uh, have more inelastic demand. Maybe you're just increasing your advertising so you can sell petrol for more. Other slightly more random suggestions, it's not a particularly strong one, but could work is cold winters, so people driving more because petrol is linked to this kind of derived demand for petrol from derived demand for cars and driving. But any of those factors nicely explained would answer uh, B part two. Uh, question C here, we have to explain the value you would expect to find if you measure the relationship between gasoline and biofuel. Use concepts of cross price elasticity. So what do we think here? We well we go back to our data where it talks about gasoline and biofuel. It says here a significant quantity of biofuel from corn ethanol. And this is a substitute for gasoline. So knowing it's a substitute, what do we know about the cross price elasticity? Well, we don't know how big the cross price elasticity is going to be. We can't really put a figure on there. What we do know is it's going to be positive because of the substitutes. If it was negative, it would be um a kind of a complement. So not a substitute, but because it's a substitute, if the price of one increases, people are just going to demand the other. So if you increase the price of gasoline, people are going to go, wow, petrol's got, got pretty expensive. I'm going to go and use biofuel, which is cheaper. Or price of petrol's gone down. Oh, I'm not going to use biofuel anymore. Petrol's, petrol's cheaper. So you can see that demand moves in the same direction of the one good, using the same direction as price of the other good when you have substitutes and when you're considering their cross elasticity of demand. So therefore, we to answer this question properly with one of the fine cross price elasticity of demand. What does that actually show? Well, it shows the change, proportional change in quantity of demand for one good in response to the change of price, proportional change of price for another good. And here we have the goods that can be substitute. You want to explain what that means. That you would either use one or the other. You, you can, they can be used interchangeably. And we'd say just the coefficient or the, the, your, the value you'd expect to find would be positive because as price moves up, demand for the other moves up to and they move in the same direction, therefore positive value. Okay, and lastly on this section, nice and easy actually, this paper is pretty easy. Question D, here we're going to discuss how reducing dependence on foreign oil might affect the aggregate demand in the US economy and the impact of this on price and employment in the US. So here this relies on your understanding kind of aggregate demand, so we might define that, we might say well we know aggregate demand composes of Consumption C plus investment I plus government spending G plus net imports, which is plus exports minus imports. So how is this going to be affected? Well, if we reduce dependence on foreign oil, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bring less foreign oil in. We're going to import less. Therefore, we can expect this minus N figure to fall in the equation or net exports X minus M overall to increase. And we like X, X minus M increasing. It's a positive part of aggregate demand. So we're going to see an increase in AD. That would be the first kind of explanation part of your, your, your of your um, answer. To get top marks here, though, you have to do a little bit of evaluation. We really want to say about how this is really going to depend on prices and employment and how how this is going to play out in the economy. It really depends on how aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the U.S. economy interact. So how much if we boost aggregate demand by um, reducing imports a little bit, are we going to actually boost supply? Uh, boost AD. Is AD going to boost even more because consumption is going to increase because it's not just that we're reducing imports, we're also increasing domestic uh, consumption of oil. So all those are valid evaluation points and those are necessary to get the final two marks. You can only get four marks uh, without doing any evaluation there. So that was actually, and kind of we did it in 10 minutes because actually that's a pretty straightforward um, set of questions. It's really important that you're able to kind of deal with these kind of basic economic economic uh, ideas in order to really answer these questions properly. Okay, moving through question 2a. Here we've asked, been asked to explain two factors that are likely to make supply of a product relatively inelastic. Um, here they want us, uh, so what we're going to do here, 
is we're going to think, right, one, the first thing we need to do is understand what it means for supply to be, to be the elasticity of supply. And basically what that is, is like, how responsive can supply be to a change in price? So if the price of a good goes up, for example, the price of corn goes up, we're not able of corn, owner, uh, corn growers to immediately or massively increase their supply. But can they do that? If they can't, then it's going to be inelastic. If it's elastic, if it's, if they can and they can greatly respond to the amounts they're supplying, to change in price, then they're going to be deemed to be elastic supply. So what are two factors to make up supply? Well, as we need to first understand that, and that's going to get what does it mean to be relatively price and elastic? Well, it means you can't actually respond very much. So what's likely to change that? Well, we might say the time period is going to be important. So if it's only over a short period of time, it's quite hard to normally increase supply. But over a longer period, it's much more easier to be flexible. We might say the nature of the product. If it's a seasonal product, uh, for example, a crop, uh, if you're around planting time, it might be quite easy to suddenly increase your, your supply because you're planting. But if you're halfway through a growing process, you can't suddenly create more tomato plants or apple trees or whatever. That takes time and just can't be done. What about the number of stocks? If you've got a product that can be stored, you might have a lot in the backup. You might have a lot in the shed somewhere, which you can then just start selling. Uh, so that's what we mean when we say stocks. Availability of facts of production. Can you employ more people easily? Can you buy more land to build another factory? Can you just suddenly start creating more products? Um, there might be a lot of constraints on that. Um, and then we want to also, when we're doing this, evaluate those factors. So we want to think about how how those factors play out. And those two explanations, plus the um, a little bit of evaluation and the application, the un- understanding, so the knowledge and understanding element of what a relatively price and elastic supply is. And what we mean by necessary supply is what's going to get you a nice eight marks there. Uh, question B is asking us to discuss how governments might attempt to make the supply of an essential good uh, more responsive to a change in its price and assess the likely effectiveness of such attempts. Well, your first marks here are really going to come from analysing the ways in which governments might attempt to increase the elasticity of supply of a product. Um, one of these, there might be many ways that they do this. Well, one of them is like buffer stocks. So you're kind of, you have to make sure there's stocks during shortages. So you make some people uh, kind of put you make companies put some of their stock away so that they're able massively to kind of rely on that when there's when there's problems. Uh, you might say, well, training programs and just making people better qualified so that there's more labor for them to employ. If you want to increase your supply, maybe with like computer, computer, computer programs or something, but you don't have enough software engineers or not enough people are trained that you can employ, then that's a problem. So you've got to make sure you have an appropriate labor supply with good skills. What about having money to invest in capital? If you want to increase supply, but it means you're buying a new tractor and you don't have that kind of money, then maybe the government should be providing loans for individuals to be able to kind of afford this stuff or incentives that promote research and development. So you are constantly developing products. All of these are going to be factors that are pretty important to, to consider uh, in this situation. Um, and then the question really is, how does this play out in... Um, in the market. Well, if you subsidize things and you increase supply of these things and um, they're really going to kind of potentially increase price elasticity. But let's think about some evaluation. Well, we want to think a little bit about the fact that maybe increasing supply, shifting supply to supply, doesn't necessarily increase supply elasticity because it's about how you need to make things responsive. Then whilst you might be able to boost supply, increasing supply doesn't necessarily increase elasticity because it's all about responsiveness. Do you want there to be availability of these things? Not necessarily just allowing these things to be used, but you need to make them available when needed. And how are we going to evaluate these things? Well, we need to think about things like cost as well. We need to think about time period. It might be a long time for the government to kind of train these workers. It might take years or two, especially if it's complicated, like technology and um, programming skills, for example, in the computer case I mentioned. Cost issues, it often costs a lot for the government to subsidize these things. They might not have... um, as, as, as much money as they would like. So all those factors are kind of uh, suitable evaluation points for you to use in that context. Uh, a nice quick uh, kind of moving on to question 3A. Here they want us to explain how the contribution of each factor of production differs in an agricultural economy from an industrialized economy. So we want to think about here the differences between our factors of production. So we need to think about what our factors of production are. Uh, we have three main factors of production, uh, land, is the first, so kind of space, labor, uh, workers, and capital. And capital is kind of like the machinery, etc., the things you input. So 
how does each of those parts of production contribute to the production process? Well, land, you need it to build factories on, you need space. Labor, these are the people who operate, they have skills, they're the individuals who contribute to the process. And capital is what they use to make the thing. So all of them contribute in some way. So how do they contribute different, differently in agricultural economies? Well, we can say that land is really important. Land contributes as kind of almost as capital in a sense in an agricultural economy. It's almost like you need good land, good soil in order to grow. It's almost like it's something that's necessary for the production process. Whereas in an industrial economy, land is simply where you build your capital, where you put your factories, where you build your, your where you put your machines. What about capital? Well, cap, labor. What about labor? Well, labor in an industrial situation might need to have higher levels of training. In agricultural economy, often um, labor is less skilled. It's, it's more unskilled labor. It's more transient labor. So labor is not necessarily kind of like secure in its employment all the time. And those are kind of pretty important factors to consider there and the differences. And then also in terms of kind of the, cap, the capital. So, well, there's a lot of capital, capital intensive industries like um, uh, industrialized economies often have quite capital intensive things. They're into manufacturing, they're into high tech. They might need to have much more expensive capital, whereas the capital you need in the case of agriculture, you need the land, the good soil, but you also might need a tractor or a combine harvester. But often a lot of these jobs can be done by humans. So maybe you need less, there's less emphasis on capital. So basically what this question is doing is just asking you to kind of like draw out some of these comparisons and Think about the different types of economies. Um, question B here, which is asking you to discuss whether entrepreneurs or governments are more likely to cause economic growth in a mixed economy. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's this is quite a tricky question actually, because what you've got to think here is like in a mixed economy where you've got kind of government on the one hand and um, private markets on the other, we've got to think about which one's likely to cause more economic growth. And there's a few. This is kind of the crux of the economic debate. Uh, over the last 20 years, which is like kind of how how does the government play out in kind of causing growth, but also not stifling kind of business and innovation. So in a mixed economy, it's especially that both contribute to economic growth. That's the first point to make is that this isn't a command economy where the government's controlling everything. And this isn't a pure free market economy where the firms have kind of free reign to do whatever they want. This is mixed. So we're relying on the firms each having each each of these uh, people, each of these uh, each of these um, kind of agents having a contributing role to play in increasing uh, economic growth within those countries. Um, so let's talk about both in turn. The entrepreneurs on the one hand kind of respond to consumer wants by investing in capital goods and expanding production to pursue profit. So the government, the, 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 the entrepreneurs really want to make profit. They really want to make money. So kind of they're into kind of this tech innovation. We're thinking about people who are starting new businesses, building new shops, et cetera, et cetera, kind of in pursuit of private profits. And still they provide a service to the economy. They provide growth. They employ people and things like that. But remember, we're not um, they're not. There's also a big issue for them. So there is market failure. And this is where the government comes in. So what you then want to talk about is that the government kind of steps in where certain things aren't provided. So infrastructure, so roads, railways. Um, all these different types of defense, all these public goods that are really necessary to cause economic growth that some people might say, and I'd claim, cause like what some might call the background conditions of growth. So you can't have businesses operating unless they're in a secure country with a good defense, uh, unless there's streetlights, unless there's trains or roads or all these different public goods. Uh, those are needed. So the, the government clearly are needed for economic growth as well. And then also merit goods. You can say there are some goods that people don't consume enough, like vaccines is the classic example of a very good. People don't consume enough. Don't, people don't consume vaccines. They're not provided enough in a free market. And it's really important that we don't have a spread of disease so everyone can more go to work and these entrepreneurs have a workforce. So the government does need to provide some of these things. I guess which contributes the most, and this is the crux of the question, is really going to depend upon like a wide array of factors. In cases where you have a recession, there's not a lot of money for businesses. Maybe the government has to step in more. And we see that. So the availability of these kind of money for private investment is really important. Equally, we then have to think about, well, what if, then how many entrepreneurs are there? How many people have these skills to kind of innovate and work in the workforce and grow the economy through private business? Are there enough or does the government need to step in? And then lastly, a good consideration is what's the government's situation? Does the government have a budget deficit? Is the government running out of money? Uh, if the government is kind of quite short of money, as it was after the recession, then Clearly, they're going to take a step back and the, the, the private sector has to drive growth and entrepreneurs have to drive growth. If it's kind of a recession or if the government has a lot of money at this point in time, 
then you might want to say, well, the government has a role to play when it has money. It should be helping private businesses along loans, uh, kind of subsidies, protection, tariffs, etc. So all these different things the government can do to create innovation are all equally and growth. They're all equally important. So you want to weigh up those factors. And that's the way that's kind of the analysis stage. And then you want to do the evaluate. And the evaluation comes here from this more likely thing. So who's more likely? So you want to say, well, in certain situations, it's obviously going to be the government that are more likely. For example, when you have a population, a recession or uh, kind of a new growing economy at the start where there's not much business innovation, there maybe isn't a culture of it. However, you might say in a really developed industrialized economy, the government's going to take a bit of a backseat. People want to develop their own businesses. People want to get ahead and pursue profit. So you kind of want to go weigh up these cultural factors, the stage the economy's at, the environment, the exogenous factors, all of which are going to play a role in um, kind of your evaluation. And over the time period, you say over the long term, it might be the private sector that drives innovation. But in the short term, when there's a problem, the government will drive growth and innovation as well. So those are coming some of the kind of key evaluation points you might be hitting. It's quite a tricky question. So I'm happy to discuss that more in person. If any of you want to drop me a message on Slack or you guys, I don't know if you've had your um, kind of live session or not yet. Uh, I probably had a lot of job interviews this week, so I've been a little bit behind on some of these recordings. So um if you want to drop a message and let me know if you have a question on that, that's that's absolutely fine. Obviously, question four um, is asking us to explain what acts as money in a modern economy and what is likely to happen to the price level if the quantity of money increases specifically. Again, a pretty difficult question, in fact. Um, OK, so let's start with the first part. What acts as money in a modern economy? Well, it's quite weird what money is in a modern economy. Well, we can say that. Kind of modern, the, 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 the money in the modern economy is kind of anything that holds value. So you can say, well, you've got this growth of things like Bitcoin, things like electronic holds of value. Technological innovation has really changed what we, we understand money to be. Uh, but money still retains these kinds of three processes as a store of value, as a means of exchange. Um, and we really want to hit those for four marks. Um, you have to think about the technology side, because what's really important here is you can only get two marks for thinking about what acts as money. To anything that has a store of value or anything that's desired for exchange. That will only get you two marks. Without thinking about the modern economy, things like notes, coins, Bitcoin, technology, etc., and comparing those, you're not going to hit the four marks for explanation here. But so that's quite a tricky start, and I'd encourage you to read a little bit more about money and modern economies, etc. Kind of Google some nice articles if you want. I can send you some resources on that. And then we're like the second part of the question is asking what is likely to happen to the price level? If the quantity of money increases specifically and in, increases significantly, sorry. So now we've got to think about quantity theory of money. So you want to think about money supply. So what happens? Well, we have inflation when we increase money supply. Clearly, an increase in money is going to push the price up of money and the general price level in the economy. But that's just one part. So this clear inflation kind of result is really important to think about. And that's going to be a nice bit of two marks. But for real uh, top answers to get the last two marks, we really need to think about a reference to this what's called the Fisher equation. So this kind of quantity theory of money, MV equals PT. If we increase the supply of money, this velocity, um, the M element, sorry, of that, what's going to happen? Well, as we say, through that mechanism, you can really show that the price of money is going to increase. So that's the inflation. So using that specific equation and quantity theory of money and velocity of money ideas is really important. And it's really important to have your head around that for these kinds of Days. And I'm, again, happy, happy to discuss more of that later. And um, lastly, the last part of this paper, uh, question B, is asking us to explain how a significant rise in the general price level will affect the current account of the balance of payments of an economy and discuss whether this is likely to turn a deficit into a surplus. Again, so this I thought the last two questions paper were kind of tricky. So I'd be surprised how many of you actually would have gone through to answer those and how many of you would stuck with question two. But. What we're looking to do here is analyze the fact that a significant rise in the general price level will likely make export prices, export prices rise and import right prices fall. Your money is now worth more. You're going to be able to buy cheaper imports, relatively cheaper to stuff in your domestic economy. So technically import prices are falling. Whilst the price of your goods hit at home that you're then selling abroad is also increasing because the general price level increase has increased in your economy. This is what we talk about when we talk about imported inflation or exported inflation. And you might have seen that a little bit. So the problem here is that the current account, the, the impact on the current account and the impact here is really going to depend on this e elasticity of demand for exports and imports. But how responsive are the import and export markets to change in price? If they're relatively elastic in demand, then we're going to see that 
we're going to see massive changes here. And it's likely to see that it's likely to be that um, we are going to get a change in the current account balance of payments. And this is likely to turn the turn the deficit into a into a surplus as we see uh, exports, exports fall because of uh, prices rising and imports increasing because of prices falling. So we are likely to see the change there. But that's going to really depend on the the elasticity. And it's important here to refer to the Marshall Learner condition. Um, That's really going to be crucial to get your top answers here. Remember that the Marshall Learner condition refers to kind of the condition that an exchange rate devaluation um, will only cause a, a trade improvement if the absolute sum of the long of the export and import demand elasticities is greater than unity. So we have to have that positive elasticity. The Marshall Learner condition has to apply for us to have a turnaround there. So that's really important. So that's going to be our analysis. Now, how do we want to evaluate this? Well, in order to evaluate this, we really want to think about what in many times is called the deficit might be affected by factors such as kind of the relative inflation rate. Um, so it's not about how much inflation is in your country. Your price level might go up. But if worldwide prices have also gone up, that's sort of a factor. It's not about inflation on its own. It's about inflation of you and your country compared to your trading partners. Um, that's going to be going to be crucial there. And then equally, we're going to want to talk about um, things like the time period. So if the inflation is only short term, then that might not impact. Um, however, if uh, we're talking about kind of a long term inflationary, then that's going to really change. And then we want to think about the J curve effect as well, which is this kind of idea that there's a trend that follows a devaluation um, initially. We see the balance initially worsening because of higher exchange rate corresponding to more costly imports and less value exports. So we get an initially bigger deficit or smaller, and then we increase. So those are going to be the kind of key factors to evaluate there. Uh, and I'm happy to go over any more of those if you like. That was a fairly quick paper. It was quite straightforward, I feel. So on that note, I'll leave it there. And if any of you have any questions, please do, do get in touch via the Slack. Thank you.